Hello, everyone. My name is Warren Shear. I use the pronouns per and pers. I'm the Assistant Dean of Students and Director for the Gender and Sexuality Campus Center at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. I'm here today with Stephen Canals, our guest. Stephen is a screenwriter and producer best known for co-creating and executive producing the FX television series, Pose. He is a queer identifying Afro-Puerto Rican American from the Bronx. He began his journey as a storyteller in high school and was named a TV writer to watch by Variety Magazine in 2018. Pose is a drama about Black and Latino dancers and models in New York's own underground drag ball culture in the late 80s and early 90s. The show features the largest recurring cast of LGBTQ actors ever for a scripted series. Canals received wide, widespread acclaim from his work with the show, including from the Writers Guild of America, and received multiple Primetime Emmy Awards nominations. The third and final season of the series concluded in June 2021. Please welcome Stephen Canals. Hello, Stephen. Hi, Warren. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. Delighted to get to spend this time with you. Likewise. Uh, so for framing, we've got a series of questions. Uh, so like an interview, but also opportunity to exchange as if we're having a conversation. So I will jump right in if you're ready. Great. First one. This year's theme for the Diversity Forum is rising above and reshaping the world in the image of justice. With the ideas of reshaping and imagery in mind, what imagery and entertainment reflected and shaped you? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, you know, when I reflect on my childhood, you know, I, I was a love, I've always been a lover of television as a medium and have been a consumer of content. Um, it's really fascinating for me to, to think about and to reflect on the content that had the greatest impact on me. Um, you know, it, what was omnipresent in the 1980s were half hour, uh, you know, multicam comedies. And the shows that seemed to have the deepest impact were shows like The Cosby Show and Roseanne, um, Funny enough, both of them have really problematic relationships with audiences today. Um, but I also really loved, you know, TGIF, for example, which was on ABC and shows like Family Matters and Full House. And it's interesting because those shows weren't reflective of my family. You know, I grew up uh, in a mixed family that was both Black and Puerto Rican, and I didn't see... A, any representation on television of a family that looked like mine, um, which obviously inspired me to then create a show like Pose. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. That that resonates with me thinking about the the intergenerational and multi ethnic family that I grew up in, and not seeing myself reflected uh, on, on TV and in in craving that. Um, Speaking of yeah. uh, family and, and the way that family is constructed uh, in Pose, my next question for you is about Pose. Uh, how, how did Pose come about and what was the experience like getting it from script to on air? Yeah, I mean, it was a much longer journey than is what often more often discussed in in the press so i think the narrative is that you know i as a mfa screenwriting student at ucla wrote the first draft in 2014 and then two and a half years later i sell it to ryan murphy and fx and the truth is that the genesis or the origins of pose date to 2004 when I was an undergrad student studying cinema at Binghamton University in New York. And I was enrolled in a course, uh, film theory, and I had a really wonderful professor who screened Jenny Livingston's documentary, Paris is Burning for me. And up until that point, as a queer identified Afro-Puerto Rican who grew up in housing projects in the Bronx, I had never seen a representation of 
black or brown queer or transness represented in in any mainstream film or television you know I, obviously rupaul existed and had a, a massive hit um with supermodel but um i i wasn't aware of Rue doing any scripted content up until that point and so um paris is burning just blew my mind you know and i also i i grew up in in the Bronx of the 1980s, right? Which was being eviscerated by both the crack epidemic and the HIV AIDS epidemic. And so to see all of these people who looked like me, who looked like my family, who looked like people who lived in my community, uh, not just surviving, but thriving and finding community and love um, and having support, that really deeply resonated for me. Um, and so I carried that with me. But I remember as an undergrad watching the doc and thinking that would make a really wonderful television show. And having the idea of a young boy named Damon, um, and because I always was a lover of the film Flashdance, I always imagined that, you know, it's this young boy who wants to be a dancer, he moves to New York, and then he gets enmeshed in this this battle, this war between two house mothers. And that was kind of the germ, that was the kernel of an idea. Uh, and I, you know, I never thought that 10 years later that I would wind up in a, in a screenwriting program and that I would wind up you know, writing it, but, but that's really how it began. And I will also note that what inspired me to finally write it in 2014 um, wasn't simply that I was enrolled in a screenwriting program, but was actually a lesson that I learned while I was working as a student affairs professional. So I, uh, I worked on a master's degree um, at Binghamton University in student affairs. And my very first class in grad school was taught by Dr. Dina Maramba. And I'll never forget the thing that she said to us as new practitioners so deeply resonated with me. And it is you as a, as a practitioner have a responsibility, any college campus that you step foot on to assess the landscape, identify where there are gaps in programs and policies and resources, and then use your knowledge, your privilege, your platform to then fill in those gaps. And so I bring that with me into my practice as a storyteller. And so what I did at the very end of 2013, entering 2014, was an assessment of the television landscape. And at that time, TV was being dominated by straight, white, cis, male anti-heroes. And we just weren't seeing queerness and transness represented. And we really weren't seeing a ton of, of black or brown bodies populating the airwaves either. And so that really, truly was the thing that inspired me to then say, oh, I should put that story on the page. So. Fantastic. And I'm so, so thankful uh, that you did. Uh, it's a, I grew up on the East Coast, but in the mid-Atlantic and ballroom culture had, a, you know, like filtered to, uh, so I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, traveled to DC to engage, you know, with friends and to, to be in environments where, um, like, or in spaces like, you know, ballroom culture, et cetera, that are predominantly black and brown, right? Like, unlike many other venues that uh, we were going to at the time, right? Like, in mm -hmm. deep feeling that resonation meant so much in much the same way that seeing oneself reflected in one's work environment and one's educational environment in on TV means so much and resonates deeply, um, can be quite transformative. Thank you so Completely. much. Completely. Paris, Paris is Burning also holds a, a very, a very significant place um, in my heart as well. Like, and I think my attachment to Noah's Ark, like when uh, Patrick Ian Pope yeah. launched that series, um, there's a connection there as well. Um, Absolutely. And speaking of uh, transformative and, and impact, my next question is about, uh, in many ways, poses um, impact. Pose has been groundbreaking in many ways, some of which include the largest transgender cast in television history, 
a cast that was largely Afro-Latinx, Black and Latine, in addition to being trans and non-binary. Why are these milestones significant? Well, it's going to sound really simple and pat, but the truth is that representation matters. You know, and I think that uh, what we never set out to be this, but I think what we wound up becoming um, both as a show, I think for me as a creator and definitely for our cast, um, who all happen to be Black, Latin, queer, trans, and or non-binary is, is a possibility model, you know, that just by our very existence, um, that there are going to be folks out in the world who now are going to see us and realize, oh, I absolutely deserve to unapologetically take up space and I have the right to dream as large as I want to. And I think that that goes, it extends beyond just the work itself. You know, I certainly, I think because I'm a writer, director, producer, I'm always meeting young folks who are like, you know, I want to tell more, I want to tell queer stories, you know, um, you know, I want to, um, I want to be the next fill in the blank, you know, great American filmmaker who happens to be queer or happens to be trans. And I think that's wonderful. But I also think that there's just a, the possibility of having a, a fulfilling lived existence that comes out of Poe's existing as well. You know, so immediately the first place I go to is I think of, we were fortunate enough to be invited um, as a series to participate in the Paley Fest in Los Angeles uh, just after our first season. And I remember after our uh, panel, a, a woman approached me and she introduced herself and she told me that she was 60 years old and she uh, found out that she had cancer and at the time she was still presenting and identifying as male um, and it was while she was going through her chemo treatments that she saw the first season of the show and told herself, if I survive, then I know that I need to be honest with myself and with the world about who I really am. And so her cancer was in remission, she beat it, and so she, and she came out at trans at 60. And, you know, I think that those are the kinds of stories that I hear about that I don't know that that would have happened had a show like Pose not existed. Wow. Momentarily speechless. Um, <laughs> which is I am too. Amazing. You know, I I I I feel um, I'm so grateful that I get to be the benefactor of so much goodwill from from people and and obviously from our audience. And I mean, I have a plethora of stories. I'm just I'm always being inundated with people's narratives. Um, and how these characters or the show has so deeply resonated and impacted them and changed the way that they now uh, move through the world. And I think that it is, at some point, maybe I'll do a coffee table book because there's, the stories are abundant and they're all so, so moving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, sign me up for an autograph copy, please. <laughs> if you... um... Thinking about the the, the various uh, um, voices and experiences that are encapsulated in Pose, um, the next the the next question centers on um, like those stories and those voices. So, in, in telling the experiences and stories of Pose, how did you go about keeping the voices and experiences of the multiply marginalized at the forefront of the process? That's a great question. I mean, I think that when, when I, when I reflect on film and television, historically, we whose lives are being represented in the work often don't have a seat at the table. Um, and our voices often are not part of the crafting of the narrative. And so on pose, 
um, from its onset, it was always really critically important to me that representation um, at all levels, you know, whether it was in front of or behind the camera was present, you know, and obviously you see that in our cast, you know, we had not one but five trans women of color um, playing trans women of color on screen. And that was important to us. You know, we were not gonna hire cis actors to play trans. Um, similarly, we had two trans women in our writer's room in Janet Mock and Our Lady J. Um, you know, we had black and Latin and trans and non-binary folks as directors on our show. Um, you know, we had black and brown queer and trans people in our hair and makeup and clothing trailers. Like that felt really critically important to me and to all of my collaborators. Like we had to have those of us who have lived that life, those of us who whose story is being uh, dramatized for an audience, participate and be part of telling the story. Um, I think that that's what helped the narrative look and feel authentic. Um, but also, everyone was paid, you know, just to be um, really transparent and direct. You know, I think that we also have a history and a culture of appropriating a space um, or rather colonizing a space and then appropriating a person's, you know, art or culture or, or narrative um, and not giving credit and not, uh, um, there not being any type of financial reward for that. And so I think once again, on Pose, what we wanted to ensure is that, you know, if your story is being told that you're also being compensated um, for that, you know, and so on our show, we had multiple consultants from the ballroom community who worked on our show. Um, if you watch Pose, all of our background actors, I think probably like 90 to 95% of those background actors were from the ballroom community. Every single person who walked a category on any episode of Pose was always actually a ballroom walker. Like we never cast anyone who wasn't from ballroom to walk a category on our show um, aside from our actors. And so that was always really important. Um, I think we, we wanted to make sure that we walked the walk when it came to the show. Mm. A directive, I think for many folks, right? That like it's you use like possibility modeling for many, many shows um, to follow in-, in Yeah, um, I, I say that often too. I always, I, I will say when I'm in spaces, particularly when I'm, I'm in Los Angeles and I'm talking to folks and we are having these conversations and throwing around buzzwords like inclusion and diversity, you know, I'm always telling folks, we need to use Pose as a case study because I think that there are, and this isn't to pat myself on the back, I, I'm sure that we have our own gaps and areas that we could have um, improved on. I know that to be the case actually, but, um, but the reality is that I think that there is a lot that we did right. And I hope that um, not just on the heels of our existence, but specifically our success, that that will inspire other producers, other studios and networks and executives to, to follow what we did. Mm, absolutely, wholeheartedly agree. Thank you, Stephen. Right. You. As you have acknowledged, um, before the entertainment industry, you worked in higher education. You were a student services administrator in the SUNY system and then at Allegheny College, right? Mm -hmm. In sort of to spark some thinking, I have a three part question or three follow up questions, if you will. Um, okay. The first one, uh, and one I think that you may have, you did get at a bit. What lessons did you learn in your time in higher education that you took with you into the entertainment industry? Well, as I noted, for sure, it's, it's you know, assessing the landscape. Um, and then being responsible. I don't know if that's the right way to articulate that. Um, 
but I do, I feel an immense responsibility <clears throat> knowing that I now have this access and this privilege to tell story, to, to look out and see who isn't being represented, whose story isn't being told, and then inviting them into the room um, and also fighting, really. And I know that seems like a really big word, but the truth is, like, we do still have to fight to take up space. We still have to fight to see our content um, be produced. And so uh, that feels really critically important to me. And that is definitely a lesson that I learned while working in higher ed, that it is, it is important that not just equality, but equity have to be tantamount to the work that we are doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Like note, note, writing notes for myself too. <laughs> uh, second question, what wisdom have you acquired from your experience in the entertainment industry that might prove helpful to educators and administrators? Oh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. Oh, that I, you just stumped me. That is a good question. Um, what have I learned from the entertainment industry? Well, I can say that there definitely are a lot of overlaps. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that um, probably the most salient lesson that I've learned from the entertainment industry. is that I don't have to do it all alone. You know, I think that I <clears throat> I grew up in an environment where I was, I think I was just socialized to be independent, you know, especially growing up in New York City and in the Bronx. I think that everyone was just as I noted earlier, was just fighting to survive. You know, like there really was no thriving happening in New York City in the 1980s. And so I think that there wasn't, it's interesting. It's like you would find pockets of support, but I think for the most part, everyone was just, you know, there wasn't a lot of sharing of resources because there were so, the the resources were so finite. And I think that in that environment, I learned to be ultra independent. And obviously film and television is a very collaborative medium. And so sometimes I think just as an individual, definitely also as a Virgo, uh, like I'm, I'm a bit of, I'm a perfectionist, I'm anal retentive. Like I, you know, like I just, I'd rather just do it on my own than ask for help or have someone else do it. Even if that is their expertise or their area, because I just want it done a particular way. Um, and I think that through the process of working on Pose, it's like I, I don't have to run myself into the ground. It is OK for me to look to my colleagues and look to my allies and say, hey, you know, let me delegate this out to you. Um, you know, and, and that has been a really important lesson for me. And I think that that also is critically important for everyone who's working in higher education. It's like you know, the, a college campus is a communal space, right? And everyone has a common goal in the way that the, the common goal for me in Hollywood is that we all want to make sure that the product we're creating is successful. You know, I think that the common goal for all practitioners is that you want your students to have a positive experience. Like you want your students to be supported and you want them to be challenged. You know, you want your students to leave the academy in whatever, you know, four or five years, however long it takes to complete their degree, um, and then go out into the world and be successful, um, you know, and to continue to give back, not just to the community, but also um, to to the institution itself. And so um, it is critically important, I think, to to turn to one another, to turn to your colleagues and to use them as as support systems and support networks and especially in a field like higher education where I, the where the burnout is so high you know it's like you don't have to do it all on your own 
you know, you have coworkers and colleagues and allies and resources. And so it's lean on each other for support. And I think that's probably the most important lesson that I've learned. Thank you so much. I know quite a few uh, educators and administrators who need that message, including myself, especially <laughs> uh, a reminder to ask for help and work coll more collaboratively. Thank you, Stephen. My final question in that vein, um, we have a student panel following our talk. What advice do you have for new and emerging creatives, especially those who seek to tell stories that are not well represented in the media? Hmm. Well, I think the first most important lesson, and I always say this to any nascent storyteller or anyone who, you know, has like arrived in LA, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed and like excited to, to storm the industry and tell stories is like, in this early part of your journey, now is where you tell the industry exactly how they want to see you and how you want to be treated. And so, you know, I think back to like the early parts of my journey when I moved to Los Angeles in 2012. And admittedly, I was already in my 30s. Um, you know, so like I, I lived a life, you know, um, and had the emotional intelligence to deal with, you know, rejection and all the other things that, that one has to deal with when they're working in, in Hollywood. But what was so important to me is that I could not dim my own light. You know, if I'm going to dim my shine, then the industry is going to continue to do that for me. And so it was really critically important for me to know exactly what I ethically and morally want to do as a creative. You know, I, I arrived in Los Angeles September of 2012 saying it is important for me to craft narratives that center my community and my people. I want to see more representation on television. Like that's, that's what I want to do. That was my goal. And so it didn't matter to me that coming out of my MFA program, that the industry was telling me that Pose as a Pilot was too queer and too trans and too urban, which we know is coded language for too Black, um, that it was a period piece, that I didn't have enough experience. Like none of that mattered to me because the stakes felt so high. You know, it's like, if you know enough about the LGBTQ plus community, then you know about the stats when it comes to LGBT youth homelessness, and you know the statistics around uh, suicidal ideation for young queer and trans people. You know, you know how, particularly for black and Latin trans women, that their life expectancy is significantly lower than it is for their cisgender and male counterparts. And so to me, I thought the stakes for my community are so high, I don't have the ability to stop. You know, no, I'm not going to continue to persist and to walk into rooms in all of my queerness and in all of my black and brownness and say, hey, this story needs to be told. I need you to invest in it. Um, and so I think that that feels really important for me to say to any young person. And I think that goes beyond storytellers. I think it goes beyond anyone who wants to make it as a writer or a director or producer. I think whatever your vocation is in any field, um, you know, if, if we are not going to center our identities, if we are not going to treat uh, who we are at our core, as if it is a precious gem, then other people aren't going to do that for us, you know? And so we have to walk into every space with our head held high, knowing exactly who we are. And this might, this comes from someone who is admittedly very militant, but with my fist in the air, with your fist in the air, saying loudly and proudly exactly who you are and not allowing anyone to, to, to not respect that and to not see you for you in all of your fullness. You know, I think that that is really important. And so, uh, and that should be the compass that guides who you choose to work with. So going back to our earlier question or, and, and conversation around collaboration, you know, mm -hmm. me walking into spaces and having someone say to me after reading that post pilot, it's a little urban, let me know. That's, it's not even a red flag. It was just a clear indicator. You're not the right person for me to be collaborating with on this project then. You clearly don't get it. You don't get me. You don't get the work. Moving on. You know, and so I think we also, 
um, to extend beyond that. I think we also have to have really discerning taste about who we choose to align with, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, and it's okay to step away. You know, it's okay that we may have worked, you know, doggedly to get to a particular place in our career, for example, and, and maybe you get there and you realize that, you know, other people's goals or other people's ethics are not in alignment with your own. And it is perfectly okay for you to step away from that place and say, you know what, I need to find another environment that is better for me, another environment that's going to allow me not only to flourish and thrive, but is also going to help me in whatever that personal agenda is, whatever that or that goal is for you. So those things feel important to me for, for the young folks who are listening. Mm. Ooh, all the knowledge, so much wisdom dropped in there, right? The like, one of the things that is sitting with me, like not, um, or how I process it, I should say, it's like not all of the relationships in our lives need 100% of us. We don't have to give 100% of who we are to every single relationship, especially if it's not being reciprocated. And I the right. piece about, um, right, I think, um, oh, now I'm trying to, I cannot remember who the quote is from, right? But like, when someone immediately, maybe it's my Angelou, when someone shows you who they are, believe them immediately. Mm-hmm. Right? So mm-hmm. it's like, the show is too urban. I instantly know who you are. Thank you very much. And perhaps I don't need this relationship. Wow. Completely. And I think, you know, it, I'm, now I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you. I'm reflecting on my experience working, specifically working as a practitioner in higher education. And I'm thinking, you know, because we want to be collegial, sometimes we'll allow people, we'll be deferential to others. Sometimes it's because there's a particular hierarchy. You know, this person is my supervisor, and so I don't want to push back. Um, Other times, again, because of that nature of collegiality, it's like, you know, this person may have said something problematic or offensive, but, you know, we're going to make this a teachable moment. And it's like, yeah, but we also need to acknowledge, like, how damaging that can be to one person's psyche or to one person's self-esteem. And I think it's perfectly okay for us at times to say, you're not my people, <laughs> you know, like, th- like we are not in alignment. And so I, there's a, now a boundary, um, or this is a relationship that I cannot invest in any longer, you know, and I think we have to be, we have to start to normalize that because I think that more often than not, what winds up happening is we tend to see, or at least I tend to see, um, people who are already historically marginalized or folks from historically marginalized groups tend to be the ones that are expected to make those kinds of concessions. Um, and, and that's not okay. Not. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. Right. I think challenging in that moment, like is, is, is rising to the challenge and re redefining justice in that scenario, what it means to hold even someone in a position of power accountable. Um, and then, modeling that you in doing it in that moment models for other people that that can be done and can be done in a loving and caring attentive way but also not continuing to engage with someone is also an act of love or care for self right that like I don't have to be around Correct. folks causing me harm etc yeah absolutely thank you Stephen dropping knowledge <laughs> um I have uh, one last question and then one prompt um, for you. Um, So my last question, uh, what are you working on now? What's next for you? Um, Well, I am really excited um, I have a lot of really fun things coming up. So I'm going to be directing, I don't know if I can say yet, because I don't, it hasn't been announced, but I'm going to be directing um, episodes of two shows. One is an ongoing series um, for Hulu. And uh, the minute I can talk about it, I will. And that's exciting. And, and then I'm going to be directing two episodes uh, in the upcoming year 
of a new limited series that will air on FX on Hulu. Um, and what I'm excited about with both of these uh, shows and directing episodes of these particular shows is that um, they both center folks of color. They both, uh, if they're not explicitly queer, then they have a queer sensibility about them. And I think that that for me is really exciting. Um, you know, I think that, again, to go back to what I was saying earlier about uh, walking the walk is that, you know, I, I don't want Pose to just be like a blip or a moment in my career. And then I use that as a stepping stone to now do other work and to leave to leave my communities behind, you know? And so I think that what I'm most excited about with those with these particular directing opportunities is that um, my personal politics, you know, and my, you know, my ethos and the way that I want to navigate my career, I still get to do that through this work. Um, you know, so it, I'm always going to have a commitment to, you know, to black and brown folks, to queer and trans folks and non-binary folks you know, so so I'm excited that I get to to work on shows that have that same commitment. And then I'm also uh, right now I'm in the beginnings of working on a new show, a new series that is um, it's horror, so it's different from from my work on Pose, but um, it still centers a queer couple, um, which is really exciting. And I think that. Uh, you know, like, as I noted earlier in our conversation, I think that there are, especially when I think about film and TV, um, there are particular places that we, especially as folks of color, have not historically populated. Like, we just seem to be, like, we're erased and don't exist in horror, and if we do, we're killed first. Um, you know, you never see us in outer space. <laughs> so apparently, you know, we don't make it to the future, um, and we don't ever get to be in action. And so I think that What's really exciting for me is to start to um, rewrite and reconceptualize these narratives that we've always seen and, and known um, and, and just to include us. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm creating a, a queer horror show and that's exciting. Love it, love it. Horror is not my genre, but I'm absolutely taking notes so I can play detective <laughs> and set aside the time. Um, <laughs> Love it. Yes. Um, immediately thought of it like, oh yeah, we're not in space or in action. Yeah. I was like, oh, we had Jordi LaForge from The Next Generation, but um, that was it. And even then, we're still deferential though. Like we're still always deferential to like our straight, white, you know, or male or cis counterparts. You know, yep. it's like, where are we when we like, I want to see you know, like I want to see a Star Wars or a Star Trek or some type of space show where, you know, there's like a, I don't know, a Latin captain or like, you know, where a black woman is is running that ship, you know, like where is that narrative? You know, it's, it's crazy that we, that still doesn't exist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephen. My last prompt for you, perhaps uh, um, a question. Uh, so in my conversations or how I often um, end my uh, meetings is to a reminder for folks to revel in, swim through or cartwheel into joy and laughter and appreciate every <laughs> moment um, that they are offered. Um, so I wanna link that, the joy with the show. Is there a particular scene or episode that when you reflect on it sparks joy for you. So a scene or an episode of Pose that that is in that you hold on to that like brings you a ton of joy. Ugh. Um there are a few. I think the one that comes to mind, and I will acknowledge up front that I'm biased because I I didn't just write the scene, but I also directed the scene. Um and and deservedly earned an Emmy nomination for my directing. Um, but it's it's in the series finale, and it is our tribute to Diana Ross. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's this beautiful moment of seeing Pray Tell, played by Billy Porter, and Blanca, played by the luminous MJ Rodriguez, um, in our ballroom community, you know, and they, they get to dance, and they have 
we, you know, we had rainfall in our ballroom set pour down on them. And it's just, it just, it makes my heart sing. Every time I see it, it makes me so happy. And, and obviously like filming it was a really emotional experience because, you know, it was the end of the series and it was one of the last scenes that we shot. Um, and so it was a really, it was emotional and for a lot of different reasons, but it's so, I don't know, it's just, it was so fun to make. And it, I mean, I filmed it, gosh, I could sit here and regale you with stories forever, but it was, I think like the, the meat of that scene was shot at like three in the morning, you know, and we were like on our set in the Bronx and it was hectic, but it was great. It was, it was lovely. And so that, that scene holds a special place for me. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I'm like running the scene through my head. Um, thank you so, so, so much. I really appreciated this time with you today. Um, and um, I will uh, wrap up as I often do, as I mentioned, um, which a, a very um, loving reminder to stay hydrated and to revel in every moment of joy and laughter that you are presented with because you deserve that and so much more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I love that. Thank you, that. Warren, this was lovely. Yes, absolutely. I hope I get to see you again and chat with you in the very near future. Likewise. <laughs>